Hey everybody, uh, I'm excited to be with you. This is actually really cool for me uh, to be able to be here today. When I, was, uh, when I went to school, when I was in my college years, I actually looked up a lot of the Entrepreneur Lecture Series stuff and, uh, and would, would watch them because I was in Hawaii, I didn't get the pleasure of going to yours. And, and there were some great ones that were actually really, really inspiring for me, it made a big difference. And so it's fun to be able to be here and sort of give back. Um, I'm sorry that I don't look better than I do. I had a very early flight. Uh, I feel like I start off most of my dates with that same phrase, but I'm happy to be here with you today, uh, even, even with my, my handy dandy Royals cap. Um, so real quick, I'll introduce myself and then talk a little bit about the company. And, and what I'm thinking is we'll just go through, I'll, I'll sort of give you, give you the story of, of uh, who we are. I know that most of you are here. You probably don't come to these normally, but you heard quilting and you said, I've got to see it. And so welcome. Uh, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know. We're actually all going to make a quilt before you leave today. So no, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so I worked, or uh, when, I, when I graduated school, I, I started out, I was a, uh, I was a homeschooled farmer from Missouri, but not like, like my mom wasn't like a hipster and wanted a better education for me. Like we needed to cut wood so we didn't die sort of homeschooling. Mom was like, you're not going anywhere. You're chopping wood. Uh, and so that was, that was sort of my roots in Caldwell County, Missouri. And, uh, and so I, I was a high school dropout, the whole thing, and, uh, and ended up going to school. See, I, I rigged it. I went to a local college for two semesters, and I was a 4.0 transfer student. Nobody cares what your high school mess up was when you're a transfer student. So off I went to Hawaii, had a great time there, finished up in Hawaii uh, and came out and decided that I, uh, or I took a job with the Semantic Corporation. And, some, and they make like Norton antivirus and stuff, but I got, a, I got a great job with those guys, like really surprising, way better than I should have sort of job. And when, when people hire you and pay you more than you're worth, they sort of buy your soul. Uh, that, honestly, that's one of those things that you'll want to watch out for as you go into your career. If you end up in consulting or something, be, be wary of that because they legitimately, like you feel guilty anytime you're not working, uh, you're, you're working overnight, you're not being healthy, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that was me for a year, uh, really laid it on the line for him. And then, uh, and then I, we, we moved out, our, I moved out to Boston. I was gonna take over our Europe operations for these guys on, uh, on some consulting stuff. And that was in 2008 and they, they canned us. They canned the whole department. They actually, they actually laid off 27,000 employees. And so when you're in good company, uh, all is well. Um, we, after that happened, I was an instant entrepreneur, right? Most of you will be like normal wage earning people until you lose your job and then you're an entrepreneur, welcome back. And, uh, and I was an entrepreneur slash consultant because I felt better about myself when I said that. And, uh, and so I, I come out of that and, and I was going to start a company with my best friend, Dave. Uh, Dave lived in Canada, and he and I were going to work on, on a company together. And so I moved in with him and his wife, you, me, and Dupree style, and I slept in the basement next to their sweet little daughter, and they were upstairs, and it was totally kosher. And we, uh, we, we started a couple of companies. We tried a wealth management firm, which uh, in 2008 was a, a poor choice. <laughs> uh, then we started a, a cleaning technology that you sell to realtors that are trying to sell their houses, which was equally poor choice. And then I started a quilting company, which, uh, which ended up doing, doing well. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. I, I, uh, after, after that, I worked on that for about a year. And then I, w I left that. I, I wanted to go and get my, uh, my MBA. I lived in Boston. I had friends that were going to very cool MBA type schools. And I was like, that's what I need to do until I looked at how much it costs. And I said, I don't need that much of an MBA. Uh, so what I did is I declared a year of the MBA. This is, you just make it up. You guys can all do it with me. Uh, you make up a year of the MBA. I saved up $18,000 and budgeted 1,500 bucks a month. I figured I needed to pay a car payment and a cell phone and then eat some cheesy raviolis and, and other Chef Boyardee products. And, uh, and so I, I had just enough there and I, I emailed all of my old business professors, all the guys that were, you know, that I kind of respected in, in business sense. I said, I need, I need your recommendations. What are your top three most impactful business books you've ever read? They sent them back to me and I got like a list of about 34 books and I bought them all on Amazon for about 200 bucks. And then I, I started thinking about where did I, you know, if I went and got an MBA, what did I want to do with it? Uh, when hopefully the thought is, is that you'll go and get, a, get an MBA 
and that some of your professors will have been from industries that you hopefully want to go back into someday. And that hopefully they'll still have been respected enough that they can still get you into those industries and they'll still know somebody there, maybe. Well, so I thought, what if I just went and found the guys who were in those industries doing cool stuff and, uh, and just like social networked my way right in. So I, I found guys doing cool stuff that I wanted to be a part of. I, I was curious about uh, venture capital, angel investing, and there was this cool group, uh, this startup accelerator called Techstars out in Boulder, Colorado. I was a huge fan, ended up, uh, like, like literally I was, I was flying around, I spent three months with each of these guys, I was like, I don't want any money, I just want to shine your shoes and work for free, and they were saying, yeah, come on, we can have shoe shiners here. And so I, I'd go and work for free, but I was like, I just want to go with you when you're, when you're having lunch and like teaching people or like running your company. And they said, okay, that's cool. And so I'd, I'd go and do this, and then I, I uh, was on my way back and saw a tweet about Techstars, was looking for a, an intern, and I rented a car in Salt Lake. I was flying from Hawaii to Missouri, uh, and I rented a car in Salt Lake, drove overnight to Boulder, like ended up in Boulder, sort of looking how I do. I said, I'm sorry, I don't look better than I do. They said, it's fine. And, uh, and they said, we really don't need awkward farmers from Missouri as our interns. Thanks, we'll try again. Took me like two more trips out to Boulder till they finally said, fine, you can have this internship. Uh, worked with those guys for about two years and then I went and did the same thing over in Europe. And so I worked on like 60 companies, start to, well like from zero to 60, right? These are all guys that are like on the back of the napkin. Like I have an idea, Techstars, their model is they'll give you, it's like a little bit like Boom Startup if you know that here in Utah. But they'll give you, they give you a little bit of cash to last for three months and then like just teach you how to, how to do it. And so I was, I was the intern, I took a bunch of notes and just watched this company go, you know, 10 companies every three months just turn over and get better and better and better. Well, on the side, uh, I, I had this quilt shop that I was working on and I actually got to be a pretty nerdy uh, tech entrepreneur, but my vehicle was a, was a quilt company. So that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. But it's, it's, fun, it's fun because I get to come from a cool, uh, a cool background with this. I love startups, I love entrepreneurship, uh, which is, which is why it's such a treat to be back here. So I'm going to show you this. This is uh, my boy, Bri Willie. He's, uh, he's, he's talking quilts for us. Tonight in a nation and a culture where everything's been sped up. Some may be sad to learn that now applies to the time-honored tradition of quilt making. It's now possible to create an individual blanket work of art in as little as a day. And as you'll see, what this one woman has done is a good thing for her small Missouri town, putting the place on the map and becoming something of a celebrity in the do-it-yourself community. We get her story tonight from NBC's Harry Smith. It looks like it's been a while since Hamilton, Missouri has been the hotbed of anything. But stop in at the Missouri Star Quilt Company on Main Street and you'll see dozens of people from miles around who have come to see and hear Jenny Doan. All I was hoping for was Here's Jenny! Doan figured out how to streamline a process that once took months and even years. That's our whole goal is to make it easy. It's always been one of these kind of mysterious things that's way out there that, that our grandmothers did. Now, just about anyone can make a quilt in a day. Who that? People who quilt the old way. The purists, yes. The purists, yes, purists. right. <laughs> when they look at somebody like you, they kind of uh, heretic. How cool is that? Well, here's my feeling. We're kind of like the McDonald's of the quilt world, you know? <laughs> I know this looks a little crazy, but... Jenny Doan's quilting revolution started with a few videos she posted oh on YouTube. I know it looks really hard, but it's so easy. In them, her philosophy. First, don't be afraid to make mistakes. And... I don't want to make something that's going to sit on a shelf that's so special that nobody wants to use it. I want to make something that is loved and worn out to the last thread. Turns out Jenny is so good and her shortcuts work so well. She's given me my therapy sessions every day. Sunshine in a barrel. <laughs> she now has 150,000 subscribers and her tutorials have been viewed more than 28 million times. And the Missouri Star Quilt Company is the fastest growing business around which is that much more gratifying because Jenny and her family have been knocked flat by the recession, says her son Al. Looking around, the fact that we have 85 employees that all feed their families because of what we do, just blows me away. So your name is Nancy? Yes. And because people now flock to Hamilton to see Jenny in person, plans are afoot for restaurants and accommodations. Amazing what can happen when you patch a few ideas together. Harry Smith, NBC News, Hamilton, Missouri. It's just poetry, man. Pulls at the heartstrings. 
But uh, let's see. Wait, how do we? We'll take care of this. Um, so so uh, that, that was a, kind of fun. We, had a, um, we have this quilt company back in Missouri. And uh, <clears throat> the quilt company, the quilt company, we, we got the idea. My mom, uh, my mom, this was 2008, which again, perfect time to start a business. But my mom had called me. She had made a quilt for my, or let me back up a little more. The, uh, my, my dad uh, was working at a newspaper place, right? And in 2008, newspapers were sort of not doing so great. They were losing people. They, were lo like, they went from a department of 35 people down to five. Dad turned like a weird shade of gray because he started working overnight again. And you're like, Dad, I think you're, you're dying. He was like turning into Casper the ghost. And, uh, and so we're watching this happen. And I was like, we got we to gotta do something about this. My parents are like, they're perpetually broke. You know, they're, everything I know about finance, I learned from sort of doing the opposite of what they did. We, they ran, we ran into some tough trouble uh, when we were growing up. My brother got a tumor. And uh, when, you, when you get a tumor, you just pay the bills, right? You, you, you put it on the account and you just go with it. And then we went bankrupt. And so we, we moved to Missouri. That was sort of the catalyst to get out there. So we're out there and like we're in this kind of crappy financial situation and, uh, and things aren't looking great. So me and my sister have been talking because we knew that we had to do something. Otherwise, mom and dad were going to be living in our basement when they got old and we cannot have that. Uh, and so we started talking about like what business should we start? What could we do? I had never started a company. Uh, my sister had never started a company, but we, but we were just sort of looking around for, uh, for what's there. And, and it's sort of a, a poetic place to be, this starting at zero uh, sort of place. You know, I'm a big fan of that idea of failing fast. I'm sure you guys have heard some of that rhetoric. Uh, the, the beauty of failing fast for me is that when, you're, when you are a zero, and I, I mean, you can go all in on every single bet because it doesn't matter, right? If you fail, you just move back in with mom, eat some ramen, get back out there and do it again. And, uh, and so like that was sort of my philosophy is I was like, we could try any of these because literally it, it doesn't matter. I, I'm like, let's see if it works. And, and uh, you know, the, the beauty of school, like the thing that I loved about school is if you weren't sure where to go or what to do next in your life, you just got to go to school. And then you had like a four year pass where you're like, no, I'm actually, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm being good and learning like everybody thinks I should. And then I'll check back out and go try it again. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times uh, when you can find the opportunity to just work in a company or, or do something while you wait for that right idea, you find, the, you find a better idea than when you're like under pressure to find that exact perfect thing, right? If you've, I remember one year I went home from, uh, from college over Christmas break and I decided I needed a million dollar idea. And I literally, I sat on the couch for a week trying, like with a scratch pad, trying to figure out my million dollar idea. I got no million dollar ideas out of that. But, while we were just like being able to look while I was still working on other stuff and just being open to ideas, we did find, we found this great golden goose of quilting. And, uh, and so, so uh, yeah, on, on this goes, mom calls one day and says, hey, I I'm, uh, I'm, took a quilt in, your sister had a baby, congratulations, I took a quilt in, we're gonna get it back. We, she took a quilt in to get it machine quilted. So when you make a quilt, you sew all the pieces together. You still have the batting, the fluffy stuff in the middle and the backing, the, the uh, other fabric, and they stitch all that together. That's called you know, getting your quilt quilted, or I don't know, it's weird phraseology, but that's what you do. You take it in, you get it all stitched together. So mom said, I took it in and I'll get it back in about a year. And I was like, a year, how long does it take to to do a quilt, and she said about five hours. And I was like, could you learn if we bought you a machine? She said, yeah, I think I could. And I was like, that's all the market research I'm, I'm gonna do. We're in, right? We, we are starting a quilt company. I'm literally, I'm like the worst business guy. You know, every book you read, I've done the opposite. I'm not, like I don't have a 10-year plan or anything. I don't do good market research. But it works out because I don't know why. Um, <laughs> learn from me, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, the, so we, we, uh, we did it. That was our market research. I'm not, I'm not joking. But then this is the beauty of starting a company in Missouri. We went and bought a 5,000 square foot old auto showroom that was sort of old and dilapidated. We bought it for $24,000, which gives you like a $280 mortgage or roughly the cost of like a good storage unit. And so we bought this old building and started fixing that up. And then we bought a $40,000 quilt machine to go inside of that, which was, which was great. A $40,000 machine in a $24,000 building. The insurance guys sort of looked at us weird, but off we went. So, uh, so we, we got in there, and then we started you know, buying some fabric and stuff. And I, I really loved the, um, the model for like Woot.com or Steep and Cheap. Have any of you guys ever heard of those? 
yeah, like, so it's this, it's this deal a day site, and they put up a new deal every day. And I was so addicted in college. Like, I was going to school in Hawaii, and I bought a, uh, a king-size feather comforter because it was only $30, and I had it shipped back to Missouri. Like, I was not eating food over there because I was so broke, but I was like, it's such a good deal. I got to get it. And I was like, if they can hook me, I can for sure hook my grandma. We're doing this. So we went in, and we started the Quilter's Daily Deal. And the premise behind this was, uh, was we were just going to put one thing up every day, and off we went. Well, the hard thing about the textile industry is it's all on a, like a bolt, right? It's a bolt of fabric. You buy a bolt of fabric, and it's got 15 one-yard units of fabric or 30 half-yard units or 60 quarter-yard units. And there's no way really to determine velocity on those sales or uh, to figure out if, if like, it's, it's, a, it's a good buy or bad buy and, and to sell it well on, online. So we started plunking around, and we started pre-cutting this fabric into these, into these squares. And it, it saved some time, but what it did for me is it gave me a, a definable inventory item that I could put on sale or know that I had 10 of and you know, just work to that, to that end. And we started this Quilters Daily Deal around that. So essentially, we started making the Lego blocks for quilting, right? So you, you buy one of these 5-inch square packs and one of these 10-inch square packs, and you put them together like like mom will show you in a YouTube video, and off you go. You're great. And so that was, that was the premise. That was the, neck, or the, uh, the, the genesis of, of all of this, was we thought, Lego blocks for quilting, this is going to be the future for us. And actually, it, it was. So yeah, so, so I mean, that's one of, the, one of the beauties of what we've done is that we took a, like an existing, very archaic industry that nobody is really paying attention to. You know, I, I, I remember was I came out of school, I had a friend that had graduated, and he had gone, he was, had graduated like a year before me, but he came back and talked, and I was like, and, and when he had graduated, he turned down like some job with Dell or something to go work with his dad, and his dad made those like metal toilet paper holders in public restrooms, uh, which I'm sure you've seen. And so when he came back, I was like, hey dude, <laughs> that's the toilet paper business. He was like, it's awesome. It's like, I'm making like 14 million a year on this thing, and there's not a single MBA kid coming out of college trying to take my margins. Nobody cares about me, and so I'm just cruising. And I was like, oh, well, good job on toilet paper. That's a really good idea. I, I mean, uh, I was going to do it, but you did it first. Uh, and, and so, like, quilting is a lot that same way, right? There's nobody coming, <laughs> coming out of grad school that's like, give me them fabric margins. That's what I want. And so I just kind of get to go be innovative in this industry, that isn't Facebook and it isn't Google, but, uh, but like it needs a good visionary in there and so we get to go and play that. So I would encourage you guys to sort of look for industries that, are, that might resonate with you a little bit but not be the most popular industries. I'll give you an example, just a brief example. This is one of my favorite business stories to tell. Um, we had, uh, we, we spent a year, this was two years ago, in 2013, we spent a year producing a magazine. So this, this company, this big company in the crafting world approached us and said, hey, we'd love to do a magazine with you. Uh, we'll call it Quilting Quickly with Missouri Star Quilt Company. And I was like, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and they said, we have a lot of distribution. You're gonna, a lot of people are going to see it. Uh, and, then, and then you're just going gonna to love it. It's going to be great. And so I said, all right, let's do it. We negotiated the same, like a little bit better contract than most people. But these crafting magazines, what they, what they would do is they'd pay you like $250 to $400 per project, right? And so we had 20 projects in the magazine, and we got like $8,000 per, per magazine for all of the work we did. But we were gonna, a lot of people were going to see it, so we had, we had to go for it. So we did four issues with them over the course of a year. And they sold 100,000 copies each at $10 a piece. So it was a $4 million business for them, and I got 32000 I was like, hey, I love these economics. Let's make them fair. And I'll keep doing this. This is a great idea. You know, you guys are obviously making money. I just want a little chunk of that. And then we'll be off. And, uh, and it was really cute. They said, they said no, uh, we really like these margins. We're going to leave them just like they are. And, uh, and, you know, unfortunately, advertisers don't like your magazine very well. It's, it's kind of not doing so hot for us and so sorry. Now, some of my best ideas are born out of hatred and spite. And this was one of them. Uh, because I was, like, I was like, don't you dare. Don't you dare. And they're like, so... She, I, I was like, if you force my hand, I will come after you and, with the North, and we will, no, and, and she was like, she said, good luck, which I love, it was sort of like a taken moment on the side, I was like, oh man, it's on, <laughs> and so, uh, so, 
So I, I, I step back and I sort of look at this industry, right? And this is an industry that was, this is a model that was built 30 years ago. You look at the magazine industry, industry and they've got ad sales teams that are calling people and begging for money. Hey, we got ads. You guys got to, you know, you got to put your, your ad in this, uh, in this new magazine. And I'm an advertiser and I hate magazine ads. Why do I hate magazine ads? I have no, they don't convert. I have no idea who clicks on them because you can't click. It's the worst. Uh, I don't know why my voice went that high. Uh, but you can't, you can't click on them. And so like I'm telling them, I only want to advertise in your digital versions. I don't care about your print versions. And so this industry is hearing, oh yeah, the paper stuff, nobody cares about that anymore. We need to go digital. I, as a magazine reader, and probably most of you as a magazine reader, as well as my grandma, who is my market, uh, they don't like reading on the iPad, right? Like they, want to get a, they want to get a magazine they can take to the toilet and read and sit there for a month and, and like, you know, they can look at the magazine. That's what they're looking for. And so, but this industry is shifting, not because of what the, consu the consumers want, but because of what the advertisers want. So I look at it and I said, well, great. Screw the advertisers. We're gonna make a magazine with no advertising. And we're just gonna go right in. We're gonna make it out of better paper and we'll make it bigger and like more focus on the good stuff because we don't need to sell any ad space anymore. I never wanted to call and beg for money for my, for my magazine. And so I started, I put on Facebook, I said, who here knows anything about the publishing world I need to talk to? I set up about a dozen interviews, went and talked to all of them and, uh, and figured out who I needed to hire. Went and hired uh, three people, a creative director, an executive or a managing editor, and then a technical writer. And so I had three salaries that cost me about $185,000. And I said, we're going to do this magazine. I need you to, you know, just let's go make it happen. And, uh, and, but everybody said, they also said, you know, watch out because in the magazine world, the paper, you know, because it's, it's printing, the printing is where all the cost is. Like well, called and I got quotes, to, like to print this magazine, which is bigger and better paper than the other magazine they were doing, I, it was going to cost me like 85 cents. I was like, screw you. Screw you guys, what do you mean that's the biggest cost? They're, they were paying 10 bucks for something that they could make for 50 cents. And I was like, those are great margins. Why do they even need an ad, an ad room? And so I was, like, I was like, here's what I'm gonna do. I, I priced it at half their price, so I priced it at 5.99. I love, I love just taking this stuff. I'm like, price it right at 5.99. Well, I'm paying 88 cents, that's a great, that's like still movie theater popcorn markups, right? I'm doing really good at that point. And, uh, and so, I needed 10,000 subscribers to make it work. Uh, now we print, every other month we're printing over 100,000 copies, like 120,000 copies of this. And it's selling out. And if you're doing the math, that's like a three or four million dollar business. It took me three weeks to put together by making those phone calls and getting it out the door by going the exact opposite direction that everybody else is going. They're trying to go to the iPad. And I said, no, no, I want, it. I want to read it. But nobody's innovating over here because they're giving up and they're moving on, right? Well, it was like, it's, it's actually, it's doing great still. Uh, the, other, the other people that had us before, they hate us. And what, what can you do? You can't make everybody happy, you know, especially when you're competing. And so, uh, so, so, so that, was, that was one of those things that like, as, you, as you're cognizant of what other industries are doing or what they're, they're looking at. I mean, the magazine industry, you'd look around and you'd be like, they've got a pretty good grasp on what they're doing. They don't, they don't, man. Reinvent that thing, reinvent it a thousand times and keep going different directions and try new stuff because there's tons of opportunity to be had there. So, uh, I'm trying to, so let's see, one of, one of the other things that we were gonna talk about, yeah, oh yeah. And, and the, the other thing that, uh, that we run into a lot is with our company, the thing that sort of sets us apart, there's 3,000 quilt shops in North America. If you've been to visit your mom, you've probably been to visit a quilt shop, right? They're, they're everywhere. And so we, as we started, there's a part of us that's like, why do we even matter? What can we do? And where we land with this stuff is we, you know, every company has to decide if they're going to know, do, or be. And for us, it's very important that we be something really meaningful. And, and every interaction that we have with a customer is all focused on, on that being good to them, you know, being somebody that they turn to, building that relationship of trust with them. The magazine was a great example of that, right? Could I have priced it higher? Absolutely. The customer knows I could have priced it higher and they actually love me more for dipping down a little bit and paying attention to that other bottom line. There's multiple bottom lines in every decision you'll make in business, right? There's the bottom line that talks about your, your return on investment or, uh, or your, your P&L statement 
And then there's the bottom line that, that's over here with the customer. And then there's your bottom line with your employees a lot of times. You have multiple bottom lines you need to be paying attention to. Well, so with the magazine, we priced it lower, we made it better, and we, you know, we, give, we give digital copies. So if you buy the physical version, I give you the digital one for free on your, on your mobile phone. This whole thing, like all this extra work, but they love us for it. And, and the cool thing, so mom, the, the, the video you watched was about a year and a half old. So they talked about mom does these video tutorials now, and that was, we get about a third of our traffic from YouTube. We get over a half million views a week, but this was important to us because we, you know, there's no ESPN for quilters. There's nowhere to like go and advertise where the quilters hang out. So we had to create it ourselves, and that was the work we did with the magazine. But we also did it with YouTube. So we, we got on YouTube and started, uh, started producing these tutorials, and people, I mean, man, they, they fell in love with them. But what was cool about it was mom would teach somebody how to quilt, right? And so she does this whole big show and, and uh, you know, like you have this very emotional connection with this woman that taught you this skill. Because quilting, quilting is one of those things that's, that a lot of people, like in the world of hobbies, uh, you know, my, my sister is actually a great example of this. She got married really young, but she, she was into painting and art and stuff, but then she became a mom. And when you're, when you're a mom, you sort of got to run this house and do all, do all the mom stuff, and you can't make the excuse to go to the garage and paint for two hours, right? You don't let yourself have that luxury a lot of times. But quilting is this very functional hobby, where at its core you're making a blanket, right? And so you're like, well, I mean, I, I can make this because I'm producing something, and look what I've made for us. And so you give yourself, you give yourself the allow, or the, uh, I don't know, I guess you give yourself, you allow yourself to go and create. And, it, and you rediscover, like, this creative side to you. It's color, it's composition, it's shape, it's, it's texture, it's all this stuff that you sort of, you sort of love anyway, but you haven't paid attention to in a long time. And so as mom would teach these people how to do this over the internet, she found that she was teaching a lot more people than she realized. You know, when we started doing these, we thought we'd, this would just be for people that worked a lot and couldn't get to a class. Well, it turns out that there's like a man with agoraphobia that can't leave his house. And so he, he found mom on YouTube, ordered from us online, and started making quilts. And he'd make them and give them to his kids. Um, mom got these, she got this great letter from this gal in, in Iran, or Pakistan, one of those. And, and she, I don't know. But she writes, she writes this letter and she says, she, she talks about how she started a quilt guild where she's gathered these women together and they order from us and get it delivered and then bring it into the country and, and they make their quilts. But she finished it, with, she said, thank you, I can't say enough. Uh, it was a little more broken English than this. I can't say enough how much I love you. You have filled my war-torn life with color. Right, which, which mom is just like, oh. you know, she can't believe that she's making this kind of a difference to people. We had, uh, you know, uh, like people, she, there's a letter of a, of a lady that after, after the Twin Towers were hit in New York, they would just, they would watch, she would gather the women in her building together, they would watch mom on YouTube, and they, would, they wouldn't even make quilts, they would just watch it and talk about what they were going to do when they could get mail again sort of thing. And she write, you know, we get these letters all the time from these people. At Christmas last year, we got 250 Christmas cards from people that were writing to Missouri Quilt Co. You know, like, thank you for selling me so much fabric, you're the best. Like, thank you for teaching us. When have you ever written a letter to a website? Like, dear Gmail, I use you every day. I can't get enough of you. Like, it doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Like, it just doesn't happen. Joanne Fabrics is not getting Christmas cards from their customers because they haven't bothered to create that experience. They haven't bothered to go that deep with their customers to prove that they really understand who they are and what they're doing and care about them. Well, we did. We did. And, and it shows in almost every interaction that we do. We're, if any of you know Gary Vaynerchuk, I, I, I love that guy. He's just an angry New Yorker. Uh, but he talks about social media stuff, and he, he gives this... This, uh, he has this philosophy of, of, with any marketing, it's jab, 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 right hook, right? You, you give and you give and you give and then you ask. And most marketers cannot figure that out. I mean, you look at big companies, they cannot figure that out. Even with us, with our, with our daily deal, we write this big story and people follow the narrative and they like, they like reply to their emails. We have a daily email list that goes out to hundreds of thousands of people that gets almost a 70% open rate. If you know anything about marketing lists, like that, that's ungodly. Like this should not happen. But every now and then I'll screw up and I won't send the email out. Like the trigger won't go. I get thousands of emails saying, where is my email? 
I'm like, I've never replied to unsent spam and said, where is my penis enlarging? I don't know. You know, like, like you n I'm never thinking about what's missing in the inbox, right? I'm just like grateful that I don't have more email. These people are, they are adamant. They are looking forward to it. But they care. They care because we care, right? Because we're driving, we're, we're worried about those multiple bottom lines. Sometimes I forget that I'm being video recorded. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Mom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, so, and so, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, I, we're kind of low on time. Did, one of the other, one of the last things that, uh, um, that I, I think I, I'll care to share with you guys that I think is kind of interesting is, is this concept of, of sort of success, right, and of making it. We, a lot of times, so, so a, about, a, about a year and a half ago, we went from our 5,000 square foot warehouse, and we built, we had to build this like 42,000 square foot warehouse. We're now on our way to building another warehouse to continue to handle uh, all of the fabric and stuff, but it's, uh, we're, we're literally, I mean, we're 220 employees now. It's this massive, massive operation in a town of 1,500 people. And so we, uh, you know, we, we got in there and started working on, on this new warehouse. And my way of doing stuff is I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the John Stockton of startups. I just try and like work really hard even though I'm not that great. And hopefully, it'll, no, oh, I'm sorry guys. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I just work, work, work. And that's how I make up for all the other, all the other stuff that I'm not great at. Well, so this warehouse is coming. And, uh, and I know that a lot of stuff needs to be built. The, the construction guys are working on their stuff. And I'm like, listen, just get me 90% of the way there. I'll take the last 10%. So we, we order pallet racking. And they're like, would you like to pay for us to set it up? And I said, no, 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 no. I'll set up all the pallet racking. And so like, I haven't done manual labor in years. My hands are like pudding, if you ever see them. And like, I'm out there till 4 AM for three weeks in a row setting up pallet racking, right? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Well, then we got about 100 computers that have to go in there. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of the only guy in Hamilton that knows how to set up a network and a patch. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. And I'm running cable and setting up computers. Then I'm building desks. And I'm like doing all this stuff to try and get us ready to launch. And I'm just, like, I'm just running myself ragged in this thing. And, uh, and then we, we write some new software to handle the inventories change and all this stuff. And then we, we launch. We have our big, we're open in the warehouse day. And, and like nothing worked. <laughs> it, it was kind of a mess, man. If you've ever, if you've ever like built, I mean, imagine, imagine like, I don't know. Don't imagine anything. The, uh, the, but we built this whole warehouse system. Nothing worked. And, uh, and then like I, I was up all nighters trying to get this thing going. And, uh, and then I went and me and my sister Sarah take a picture in front of this new warehouse and I, I had to fly out to somewhere else. And I was, as I was going home, I was writing this blog post on the airplane and I went and found pictures of Sarah and I, my sister, when we first opened the business, right? And we're, we're like, ah. you know, we're so excited, so happy, just like sheer excitement on our face the day we opened this business. And then we're in the same pose six years later in front of the warehouse where it looked like somebody had like punched you right in the gut. You know, we're like, and, uh, and, I, and so I'm writing this and like, and I, I'm like, this is, you know, I, I'm, I'm like not having a, a very great stable day at that point. I give myself two mental breakdowns a year. I was on number two and so I knew I was used up. Um, but I called her and I said, I was like, Sarah, like, did we make a mistake? Because I'm not happy like I was six years ago. You ever, do you ever worry about that? Did we not do it right? Like, maybe we're screwed up. Maybe we shouldn't be here. And my sister was really smart. She said, uh, she said no, you know, I, like, I, th I think we're happy. <laughs> I think. Uh, she said, but, but what's different, uh, when, when, like, you know, when, when, you know, a newlywed couple, and you take that picture on your wedding day, you're like, I'm so excited. And then you get that picture four years later, and they're like, we're married. We're still there. And like, it's good. It's good. It's good. Or then you're like, I'm pregnant. I'm having a baby. And then like three weeks in, you're like, we've got a baby. And we're really happy it's here. <laughs> we got one. We got it. You know, it, it's not that you're not any less happy, right? But you sort of understand the cost that comes with that happiness. You've associated that, it, that it's not, it doesn't just come. It's not just free. And that's what a lot of people will never see. You know, the people that are like, oh, I want to I own my own business someday. I'm like, you... Do you? Because you don't know what this is doing to me. And 
<laughs> it's like people are like, oh, you guys are married. You got it all figured out. Way to go. Way to go. I want to be married someday. That's so perfect. And you're like, like people that are in a marriage are like, yeah, all right, it's good. It's good. But it's not, it's not nothing, right? It takes work. You're, you're putting time in on this. And so, like, understanding that sort of changed my world a little bit so far as startups go, because we have this picture in our mind of what that success is. And I promise you it's elusive. I promise you as you go towards that that it's, that it's fleeting and it moves around. And so, sort of understand what you're looking for. Understand what that, what that feeling is uh, and, and make sure that it's worth it. Because when you, when you get there, uh, you want to be able to look around and be like, yeah, no, I'm... I'm definitely happy. This is where I want to be, and this is right. So uh, that's that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. Do you guys have? Uh, do you have any questions or anything that? Uh, oh. oh, we are going to have a Q and A session in seven ten. I hope you'll all come with sandwiches. I know there was just pizza here. We can't compete with that. I'm sorry. There's Jimmy John sandwiches upstairs. Uh, we hope that you'll that you'll join us. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out.